So last week we covered a lot of the area and the volume formulas. We talked about how you know if it's an area formula, how you know if it's a volume formula. Um, areas, areas usually trying to cover something or they use the word area. Volumes usually if you're trying to fill something or you have like a liquid inside a container or um, they'll actually use the word volume. So we saw all the area formulas, but we didn't see all the volume, volume formulas in practice. We saw cylinder last week, and we saw, nope, having a little technical issue here for some reason. My whiteboard is not letting me write. Let me refresh the page really quick. I thought I had it all set up so we'd be good to go. Sorry for the delay. Okay, now we can see it. So we saw a cylinder last week. Uh, we saw a rectangular prism last week and we saw a sphere last week. And if you weren't here last week, you can always watch that YouTube video. But we also have cone, pyramid, and right prism. So a cone basically looks like an ice cream cone. You'll either have it with a point up or you can have a cone with the point down. The important distances on the, co on the cone are R for radius and H for height. If we know those two numbers, we can plug them into the formula and find the volume that would fill up the cone. So the radius has to do with the circle part. That's either the bottom of the cone or the top of the cone, depending on which way it's facing. And the radius goes from the center to the outside of the circle. It can be in any direction as long as it goes from the center to the outside. The height can either be written inside the cone. Usually they'll have like a dotted line inside. Or they'll write a line to the side and label that as the height. So let's give it some numbers now. Let's say our radius is 2 centimeters. And our height is 8 centimeters. That's all the information we need to find the volume of the cone. We can plug those numbers in to find the volume. So we use the formula 1 third pi. Now as we discussed last week, when they have these variables all next to each other, it's really all multiplication. And I'm going to use not the old school X to mean multiply, but the dot that means multiply. So this is one third times pi times r squared times h. Oh, and I forgot to explain, this is the actual OGT reference sheet. You will have access on the actual OGT exam. You don't have to have these memorized. So you can actually look at this formula and see I have one third pi don't have to just have it memorized off the top of your head. So one third times pi. Now you'll notice over in the circle formula area, it specifically tells you that you can replace pi with 3.14. Pi is approximately 3.14. So we're gonna write that in instead of the pi symbol. Times r squared, now we replace the variable. Instead of the letter R, now we write the two. And then we keep that squared. So two here was the radius, the little two up above was just part of the formula. And then we have the height, so times eight. So now, how do we plug that into a calculator? We've still got to follow that order of operations. which is parentheses, exponents, multiply, divide, which is actually grouped together, and add, subtract. 
that's grouped together as well. So if there are any parentheses, you do whatever's inside the parentheses first. We don't have any parentheses, so we skip that. If there's an exponent, we do that next. So two squared is actually the first thing we do, and it's kind of weird because it's just smack dab in the middle, but according to the math operations, it's what we do first of all. So two squared means multiply two by itself. Squared means use two of the same number, two times two. So on the calculator, you could type in two times two to get four, or you can use a squared button. Two squared still gives you four. So now we still have everything else. One third times 3.14 times four times eight. So now we look at the next step. We've done exponents. Next comes multiply divide. When it's only multiply and divide left, we have the fraction bar, that means division, and we have some multiplication. We just go from left to right. There's no add or subtract involved. We just go left to right. So on this, we can actually just plug the rest into a calculator. We don't wanna do something like this by hand. So the fraction, one over three, that means use the divide button. One divided by three, multiplied by the 3.14, multiplied by the four, multiplied by the eight. So once you've typed that all in, they'll usually tell you a number to round to. So let's say we're rounding to the tenths. Let me write the decimal out first. 33.4933, and it kept doing three through three over again. But let's say we want to round to the tenths spot. So the tenth spot is the number right after the decimal. And when you're rounding, you have to decide, is that going to stay the same? Is that still a four? Or will it round up to a five? And we look at the next number to determine that. Since the next number is a nine, nine is five or bigger, so between five, six, seven, eight, or nine, those make the number round up. Nine will make the four round up to a five. Because we're closer to 33.5 than we are to 33.4. So now we've covered cone, we also have pyramid. I'm gonna kind of block this out to show there is our cone spot. So on our pyramid, there's actually a couple of different ways to draw pyramids. It depends on the bottom shape of the pyramid. So these shapes are both pyramids, but one of them has a base of a rectangle, and one of them has a base of a triangle. So the formula for a pyramid is a, li a little bit vague because you can have those different bases. It just says the, little, the letter B. The capital letter B is standing for the area of the base. So when we look at this first one, we say, well, the base is a rectangle. What is the area of this base? Then we have to go over to our area formulas. For a rectangle, the area is length times width. So for our first shape, the volume is one-third times length times width times h for height again. So since the base was a rectangle, we used L times W. 
for the next one, it's going to change slightly. We have a triangle this time. Area of a triangle is one half base times height. So we still have one third. That didn't change. But now the area of the base changes. The area of the base this time is a triangle. So now we have one half times the base times the height. So this stuff here was area. And then times height again, because we need the height of the pyramid. So this formula can be a little bit tricky because you do have to be a little bit flexible depending on the actual base of the pyramid. Now on both of these pyramids, I have not drawn the height in yet. The height goes from the center of the pyramid to the center of the base. So we would need some more information to actually find the volumes. Let's say on our first shape, we know one side is six, the other side is two, and the height is seven. Once you know that information, then you can plug it into the volume formula. The length times width had to do with the base, so it's the two numbers on the base, the six and the two we plugged in for length and width. The height is the height of the pyramid itself, so we plug that in for h. So the whole formula would be one third times the length times the width times the height. And again, at this point, use a calculator. Especially with the fractions involved, those can be hard to work with. So anytime you have a fraction, just use the divide bar instead. One divided by three times six times two times seven. There is only division and multiplication, so we could go straight to plugging it into the calculator. That gives us a volume of 28. So for the triangular pyramid, the base was a triangle. We would have information on the sides again. Let's say this is 3, and this is 8. And then the height of the pyramid, let's say that is 11. So now we plug these in again. We already figured out that area of a triangle is one half base times height. So on the triangle, the side here is base, and this side here is height of the triangle. And the other h, it's kind of confusing because there's two h, h's. We have to know one is height of the base of the pyramid, and one is the height of the pyramid itself. So that's where we would plug in the 11. So one third times one half times a base of three times the height of the triangle is eight times the height of the pyramid is 11. And again, order of operations wise, we don't have any parentheses, we don't have any exponents, no add or subtract. We only have division and multiplication going on. So we can just go left to right. We start with one over three, so we use the divide sign again. One divided by three multiplied by one divided by two times three times eight times 11 is 44. And on the OGT itself, you will get a calculator. Um, it's a specific type of calculator. It's a TI, 30, I believe it is, um, but you can still do those same functions. You can still do divide, you can still do multiply. It'll look a little different than the one I'm using on the screen, um, but it still has the same features. 
so last one is a right prism. So a right prism is actually similar to a right pyramid in that the base of the prism might be a different shape. So a prism is just extended out in length. So the base of this prism is also a triangle. And it has similar features to the pyramid. On a pyramid, instead of writing an actual formula for the base, they said, well, it depends on which shape. If our shape of the base is a triangle, we still use area of a triangle, one half times base times height. So a right prism, that's a triangular prism, would be one half times base times height, times height of the prism. We're gonna have that double H again here. So on our triangle, we would need some information. They'd give us the length of the sides. Say the lengths of the sides are four and nine. And then the height of the prism itself is from top to bottom, it's from base to base. And let's say that's 12. So now again, we can just plug those values in. Volume is one half times the base of the triangle. Not the base of the prism, but the base of the triangle. So four times the height of the triangle. So nine times the height of the prism. So the 12. And then we plug it into a calculator. One divided by two times the four times the nine times the 12 is 216. And all of these volumes are telling you how much could we fit inside. Um, the cone shaped one is a good one for a word problem because they could say it's an ice cream cone and they could say well how much ice cream actually fits inside the cone itself. So those are the volumes we missed last week. Um, again if you need the other volumes they are on the YouTube video from last week. So next, we're talking about how to take a word problem and change it from sentence format into an equation format. So for this, you'll see I have a long list of possible words that mean each math operation. So for addition, if the word means to put a plus sign, you'll see words like increased by, more than, combined, together, total of, sum, plus, added to, greater than, deposit, and. And deposit's kind of a weird one. That's like a bank account, but if you deposit something in your bank account, you're adding money to it. You're putting more money in. So if they say the word deposit, it still means addition. Subtraction has its own set of words. Some of them are similar. You know, addition had increased by, this will have decreased by. So decreased by minus less one used a lot is difference. You'll see that quite often. So when they say the word difference, it means you're gonna have to do subtraction. Less than, fewer than, left, smaller than, change, withdraw. Withdraw has to do with that bank account idea again. You're taking money out this time. Multiplication has words like of, times, per, Multiply by, product, increased by a factor, twice means specifically multiply by two, and triple means specifically multiply by three. So it still means multiply, but multiply by a specific number. Each, by, and every. A division, you'll see words like out of, ratio, quotient, equal pieces, split, half, dividing, 
of every, and very occasionally you'll see this double use of per. Per almost always means multiply. Every once in a while it means divide. And then you'll know to put an equal sign if they say the word is, are, was, were, will be, gives, yields. And you know, there might be other words on any of these lists. Most of them will be kind of in the same category. You'll get the same feel of all of these types of words mean equal. All of these types of words mean addition. So some less used ones are if you have some inequalities. Less than is specifically just a less than symbol. Less than or equal to has the line underneath. No more than is kind of tricky. We see the word more and we want it to be greater than, but when it says no more, it's actually less than or equal to again. More than or greater than is the greater than symbol. More than or equal to or, okay, so sorry, I didn't understand whether I was writing there at first. More than or equal to, that's one side. That means greater than or equal to, or the words greater than or equal to means greater than or equal to, put the line underneath. At least is also greater than or equal to. When it's the word at in front of least, it's backwards of what we expect. And then squared means to put a little two up above, and square root means to put a square root symbol. So we need to know these words because when we write out an equation, we're basically translating the words to the math symbols. It's like learning a new language. So here's an example. Jill charges a base rate of $25 per lawn plus $18 for each hour she mows the lawn. Which equation gives the amount of money M Jill earns from mowing a lawn for H hours? So some key parts here are the 25 per lawn plus 18 for each lawn, or sorry, for each hour. And then the amount of money M she earns from mowing a lawn for H hours. So how do we change that to an equation? Well, we know it said M is money, H is hours. And we wanted to figure out how much money, so you'll see all of the M's are on the left side, and H goes with the numbers. So we look for hour, and we see that 18 goes with hour. Those are together in that same part of the sentence, 18 for each hour. And each was on our list to mean multiplication. So 18 for each hour would be 18 times H. Now most of the time they don't put that multiplication symbol when you have a number next to a letter. They say 18H. That's the same thing. It's assumed that this is 18 multiplied by H. They don't need to write the multiply sign in. The first part of the sentence said $25 per lawn plus. So we know we have a plus sign before the 18. And then this one's kind of weird, 25 per lawn. None of the variables are lawn. None of them are L's. So really they're saying they're charging $25 for each one lawn she mows. So this is one of the cases where per is a little bit vague. Instead of meaning 25 times L, it's really just 25. If you do $25 times one lawn mown, that's still 25. So the full equation is the amount of money she earns is 25 plus 18H. Now when you do these translations, just because the sentence was written one way doesn't mean the equation has to be in the exact same order. What does have to happen is the 18 does have to be with the variable and the 25 doesn't have a variable. But you can switch the order. We could write 18H first and the 25 second, and those two things are the same. 
So you'll notice none of the answers were written the first way we did, even though that's the order the sentence went in, we can change that order if it doesn't match our multiple choice answers that we're given to choose from. Just keep in mind that you really have to keep that number that is attached to the variable together. It's got to be in that correct spot or else the equation doesn't make sense anymore. So here's one more example. At the beginning of the day, the owner of a restaurant opens a new case of takeout boxes. One case holds 500 takeout boxes. So there's some key information. It can help to underline it as you go through a problem. He uses an average of 35 takeout boxes each day. And uses is another key word here. Based on his average usage, which expression represents the number of takeout boxes that remain D days after a new case of boxes is opened? So again, once you get those variables involved, it's really good to identify, well, where is that variable? So the word day happens with the number 35. 35 takeout boxes each. Each we learned is multiply and day we're representing with the letter D. So 35 times D. It also said that one case holds 500, so that's our starting amount. So we start with 500 and we use 35 each day. So use wasn't on our list specifically, I don't think. Let's double check, there's a lot of different words. None of them specifically say the word use, but we want to pick the category that it fits in the most. So subtraction is about taking stuff away. It's withdrawing money or you're pulling stuff out of a total amount. So the word use could be added to this subtraction list. So we start with 500, we're taking away and using 35 each day. So minus the 35D. And if you're ever confused, it's hard when there's so many words going on, the sentences are hard to translate. One of the key things to focus on is that variable. Day had to go with 35. So you can eliminate two of the answers. C and D just don't make any sense because the D went with the 500 and it should have gone with the 35. Then from there, instead of figuring out the whole equation yourself, you could say, well, the keyword here, use, does that mean subtraction or does that mean addition? And we knew it meant subtraction. So that can be a helpful way to look at the answer choices and not necessarily write out the equation yourself. So they can get a little more complicated and have more equations going on at one time. Instead of just having you translate and write out one equation, now each answer choice has two equations. So a company is comparing two different postage plans for next year. The company can purchase a postage plan where the total cost, C1, is $45,000 plus $3,000 per mailing. So we have cost is C1 is $45,000 plus $3,000 per mailing, where N is the number of mailings. So there's all our key information for the first one. The next sentence says the cost, C2, of the other plan is 35 cents for each piece P mailed. Which of the following is a set of equations modeling the costs of the two plans? So we have to write equations for both. They told us specifically that cost is C1, and then they used the word is. We haven't had to use this yet on the other problems, but if we look at our list of possible words, we'll see that is goes with the equals sign. 
So we have C1 equals 45,000 plus, the next word is plus, and we know plus means use an addition symbol, $3,000 per mailing. Per almost all the time means multiply. So per means times the mailing, and they told us a variable to use, where n is the number of mailings. So the full equation is C1 equals 45,000 plus 3,000 n. So we can again go eliminate some answer choices. The first answer choice, A, puts the n next to the 45,000, so this one doesn't work. The same thing with answer choice C. Oh, I wrote an extra zero on accident. It was supposed to say 45,000, not 450,000. That was just my mistake when I was typing. Um, let me fix that really quick so it makes sense with the rest of the problem. But it still isn't the right answer because they put the N with the wrong number. So now we're down to B or D. As you go through a problem, elimination is a great way to give you a better chance of getting the answer correct. So the next sentence said the cost C2, and again it used the word is to mean put an equal sign, 35 cents for each piece. So the word each, or the words for each, again mean multiply. A lot of the equations end up with some multiplication. And then each piece, but they say use the letter P for piece. So we have C2 equals 0 0.35 P. You have a number next to a letter. You don't have to write the multiply sign. So that means our final answer is answer choice D. Answer choice B had a plus sign and we know it should have been multiply. Okay, um, one more and then I think I move on to a different type after this question. So, Michael paid $6 for a ticket to a football game. So $6 for a ticket. Soft drinks at the game cost 75 cents. Michael bought X drinks at the game. Which equation represents the total amount Y he spent? So this time, instead of saying comma, they put parentheses around the Y, but it's still just saying the total amount is represented by the letter Y. So that's why all of them start with the letter Y. So the $6 he paid for a ticket, that only gets spent one time. That means we just need six to be involved in the equation because it's only entered in once. So I did get a response or a guess of what it was and you are correct. It's 6 plus 0.75x. Um, the one ticket gives you the 6. And then if you're spending more money, we use a plus sign. And it said it was 75 cents for each drink. So we use the 75 cents times x. Thank you, Alicia. Alicia? Sorry, said that wrong. Alicia is <laughs> probably the more correct way for your correct answer. So that is the correct equation. Um, and keep in mind, answer choice A is kind of close, but when they put parentheses around the whole thing, they're saying the X goes with the 75 and with the six, and the X should only go with the 75. Um, it doesn't say six times the X, it's the 75 cents times the X. I'm sorry, I guess that was Tyler. Thank you, Tyler, for your correct answer. So, 
Um, this one's slightly different in that instead of being an equation, now we're going to actually have an inequality. It's really the same concept, except now instead of using an equal sign somewhere, we have to make sure we use the correct inequality sign. So a band pays for the use of a location for a concert. The band charges 25 per ticket. There's that per again, so that means multiply. If N represents the number of tickets, so they said instead of the word ticket, use a letter N, represents the number of tickets sold, and C represents the cost of the location. There's our other variable. Uh, which inequality below describes how many tickets need to be sold to make a profit? So profit is kind of a word um, that you hear a lot in business. To make a profit on something, you want to make more money with what you sell than what you have to pay to create an item or this, in this case to rent out a place to have this uh, concert. So you want to make more money and not spend as much money. So 25 per ticket, we know ticket is N and we know 25 goes with N. So again, we can eliminate some answers because 25 shouldn't go with C, 25 shouldn't go with N. So we just have to decide which side do we want to be more. Do we want, in this case, they use a less than symbol. So the 25 N is making less than the cost of the location. And on the bottom line, the 25 N is making more than the cost of the location. So 25 times the number of tickets. So even though it doesn't say the words greater than or doesn't say the words less than, we can figure out which inequality symbol from the word profit. We want what we charge to be less than what we pay. So we want the 25N to make more money than how much our cost is. And again, let me know if you have any questions. Oh, and April gave a response to that one too. Sorry, I saw that kind of late. You were correct. D is the correct inequality symbol. I have to, the chat doesn't notify me, so I have to keep looking over for when you guys send a chat. So this is a similar concept, but instead of having to create your own equation, um, we're actually going to use our answer choices. It gets a little more complicated when they give you a table and they say create a function from that table. When there's the words, you can do the translation parts. You can say, well, plus means put a plus sign. Use means put a subtraction sign. When there's a table, they just give you a whole list of values for a function and say which equation represents this function. And there's ways to figure that out, figure it out from the table to say, well, what happens between here and here and what happens between here and here? But they're kind of hard and complicated. When you have multiple choice, sometimes it's easier to take the multiple choice answers and use those to help us answer the question. So basically what we do is try each answer choice and see which one works. So let's try answer choice A first. So here we're testing answer choice A, and what we're going to do is we're going to plug in an X value and check to see if we get the correct Y value. So wherever we see X, we're going to replace it with a one. When we do that, we have to use our order of operations again. There's really only one thing to do here, which is square. And be super careful. One of the most common mistakes is to say, oh, one squared, that's one times two, so it's two. But squared doesn't mean multiply by two. It means use one two times. Instead of one times two, it's one times one. 
So one times one is just one still. So is this the correct answer? Did we come up with the matching y value we were supposed to? So no answers yet, so I'll just go ahead and let you know. No, we didn't. We got a one, we were supposed to get a four. On our table, the X has to match with its Y value that's right next to it. So this answer choice didn't work. If that happens, now you try the next one. Try answer choice B. And we go through the same process. We can even use the same X value. We're going to plug in one again and still see if we come up with the correct value of four. So we replace x with one. This time when we do order of operations, we do have two steps. We have an exponent and we have a plus sign. And according to order of operations, exponents come before addition. E comes before the a. So 1 squared is still 1, but then we have the extra step of 1 plus 1, which is 2. Still not the correct answer. We want to get a 4, so this guess and check method can be a little bit long, but when you're taking the OGT math test, or any math test with multiple choice, sometimes using the answer choices is easier than trying to do it kind of the correct mathematic way where you go through and analyze the table. So let's try answer choice C. And we do the same thing. We're going to replace the X value with one. And then we simplify. So this time we have parentheses. The first two we did exponents first. This time we do parentheses first. So inside the parentheses is one minus one, which is a zero. And now we do zero squared, which again doesn't mean do zero times two, it means do zero times zero, which is still zero. So still not the correct answer. We wanted it to come out as four. So if we eliminate all the other answers, we know our choice correct answer choice is D. That's the only thing left. If you're unsure, plug it in and try that last answer choice. This time if we do inside the parentheses we get 2 and then we do 2 squared which is 2 times 2 or 4. So that shows that we did get the correct value and D is the correct answer. So another type of problem where instead of, again, doing an exact math translation, it's more just about taking an equation they give us and kind of analyzing it. On the table, we were given a whole bunch of equations, um, and then we just plugged values into each one to check. This problem says the number of hamburgers sold at a local restaurant varies inversely with the price that is charged. Now, you probably don't know what varies inversely means. Sometimes you don't need to know. If you keep reading, don't give up just because you don't understand the first part. Say, okay, well, let's read the, read the last rest and see what happens. So the number N of hamburgers sold at price P in dollars can be found using the formula N equals 687.5 over P. So they gave us a formula. We didn't have to come up with it. We're not gonna have to translate anything. You can translate the word varies inversely, but they did that part for you. Approximately how many hamburgers did the restaurant sell if the price of hamburgers was $3? So um, they basically told us a price of the hamburgers, and we know price is the letter P. 
This one is a lot of fancy words for plugin three. Sometimes they make them sound so confusing, but the actual process is pretty straightforward. Plug three in instead of the letter P, and then plug it into a calculator. Calculators are great. Use calculators all the time. There's no point trying to do something like that in your head. And if you mess up on your calculator, clear it out and try again. I hit the wrong button. So that's 229.16666. Now that doesn't match exactly, but they did say the word approximately. So even though technically the exact amount is this 229.16, we go with the closest one, 229. I think I have one more question and then we'll take any questions you guys have. Yep, so one more. Now this one's very much like the table problem we did before. The only difference is they use this fancy notation f of x. That's really just a fancy way to say y. There's some advantages from using that notation, but almost all the time we can just know that really this is that y value. So Kim is selling sandwiches for a school fundraiser. She made the chart below to help her with pricing. Which function represents the cost of the sandwiches? Well, we still tackled this the same way. Even though they changed the notation, we're gonna try each answer choice and see which one works. So the first one is 1.15 multiplied by X. Again, they're not gonna write in the multiplication sign. If you have a number directly next to a letter, that is multiply. So multiply by, and I always just pick the first x value on the table, three. And then it has to go with its corresponding y value. If we get 3.45, this is the correct answer. So 1.15 times three is 3.45. So this one was a lot easier than our other table question because we don't have to go through every single answer. We got the right answer on the first try. So that's all the questions I had prepared for today. Do you guys have any questions uh, about the OGT or from your current math courses that you want to know about? So far, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, when and where do the OGTs take place? That question just popped up. So they've changed the format, and so they're still arranging everything for the OGTs, and we actually don't quite know yet. Um, Amy is working hard to figure it out. Instead of going to a school during a certain date, it's gonna be you go to like a computer lab somewhere, and they're gonna have a lot more flexibility, like it's gonna be multiple weeks or even a whole month. So the setup's a little bit different. And as soon as Amy knows, she's gonna let everyone know. And as soon as Amy lets me know, I'll also let everyone know just so all our bases are covered. But right now we don't know for sure. Um, let me ask her really quick if any updates are, have there been any, uh, uh, any changes on when the OGTs are gonna be offered? Do we know when and where yet? So for sure the month of October, she says. Okay, so definitely the month of October. So there's a little more information. Um, she says she's still pinning down the locations. It's different for every district. So she's got to work it all out since they just made changes. Um, yes, there is. So you can just Google OGT math tests. All the questions I pulled today were from these practice tests. Um, and you can use, there's a whole bunch of PDF files. The test files are the first column. This is actually the questions. And you can scroll through and do some practice problems. 
Um, and as you're working, if you have a question, you can always text me on Remind 101. Um, and if I'm not, you know, in the middle of something, I'll answer right away. If I'm in the middle of something, it might be an hour or two, depending on when you texted me. But if you're like, I just don't get this question, how do I do it? You can always let me know. Um, the answer document isn't super useful, but the answer key tells you the correct answers for the questions. So number one, the answer is A. There's a lot of information. The content standard, standard benchmark column always gets me because I'm like, oh, the answer is B, but that just is some notation they're using for themselves. You really want this last column, the answer key column. Um, I think there is an online version. Yep, so if you Google Math OGT, it'll take you to this page. Additional resources for the Ohio Statewide Assessment. You can click on that link. If it will load. So if, if, if you don't like looking at the question as a PDF file and you want to do it actually online, this should be a place you can do it. Oh, hmm. Maybe it's not a valid link anymore. Hmm. I will look into that and see if there's still an online option. Since they're changing things up, maybe they don't have that option anymore. Um, I don't know if it's just a random, like they're having server issues or if the site just doesn't work anymore. So I'll research that and let you know. Uh, this website, you want me to send your email? Or the, once I found out more information about the online version. Yep, I will do that. I'll do a little research and I'll let you know. You're welcome. Any other questions? If we don't have any quest other questions, then, okay, perfect. Um, then we do have the another OGT session next Wednesday at 5. Or if you're taking any of the general math classes, then there's a math session tomorrow at 2.30 Ohio time, which is also Michigan time, 12.30 Utah time, or 1130 if you're in Washington. Depends on what state you're in. So if you want some more math help just with your courses, that would be tomorrow at 2.30 Ohio time. Well, thanks for joining today and I hope you guys have a great day.